Um, so I've been asked to provide an introduction to this seminar. I think I, I would have preferred an afternoon slot, not least because you'd be a much more forgiving audience after partaking of a glass or two of vegan wine at lunchtime. Yes, we do have some. <laughs> um, I think the best way of introducing this seminar is to provide a guide to the relationship between ethics and public policy as it applies to farm animals. And this thought stems from a simple but nevertheless profound observation. This is that what we regard as the correct public policy approach to farm animals will depend largely on what we think we ought to do. And this of course will, uh, this of course presupposes the adoption of an ethical position on the moral status of animals. So what I'll do in this uh, relatively brief talk is, is to outline the various ethical positions that one might adopt and say something about what each one means for the treatment of farm animals. So this is mainly an exercise in semantic analysis, an exercise in defining our terms. That is, I'm not primarily concerned with adjudicating between competing ethical positions, although towards the end I will make a number of <clears throat> Excuse me. Points about the process of doing that. Now I've got a I've got a number of slides today. Um, don't worry if I, I go through them too quickly because they'll be available on the, the centre's website. And indeed, all the talks have been videoed as well. So I want to start then by providing you with a list of the most important positions that it's possible to adopt on the moral status of animals. This is, of course, not comprehensive. It doesn't, for instance, refer to the utilitarian position associated most notably with Peter Singer, although I will talk about utilitarianism in the context of animal welfare. Nor does it include the virtue ethics approach, which is associated most notably with the New Zealand-based philosopher Rosalind Hursthouse. Finally, it doesn't refer to the so-called contractarian approach, mainly because different versions of the contractarian approach can support a, a number of different positions in the debate. So, for instance, the, con the contractarian account provided by uh, the philosopher Peter Carruthers, for instance, uh, seeks to justify the claim that we have no direct duties to animals, whereas, by contrast, the um, uh, contractarian approach by Mark Rowlands justifies according to animals and moral status, more or less equivalent to, to humans. So leaving those uh, approaches aside, I, I'll focus on four main positions on the moral status of animals that we might choose to adopt. And these are the so-called indirect duty position, the animal welfare position, and two versions of an animal rights position, an abolitionist rights position and a, what I call a sentience-based rights position. So I'll look at each of these in turn. We start with the indirect duty position. I mean, prior to the 19th century, it was common in theory and practice to regard animals as morally unimportant, as entities lacking moral standing. And this position was partly based on the view that animals are not moral agents in the sense that they're not capable of recognising right from wrong or capable of participating in moral agreements. This is a position associated particularly with uh, Kant. The moral unimportance of animals has also been based on this assertion that they're not sentient, having no ability to experience pleasure and pain. And this is a position associated with Descartes. As a result of all of this, it was commonly held that the only obligations humans uh, were held to have towards animals were indirect ones. That is, harming animals only became, uh, becomes morally significant if it harms the interests of other humans, such as those who own them. So according to this indirect duty position, then, we, we should protect anim animals when it's in our interest to do so. Animals are protected, in other words, only as a byproduct of the pursuit of human interests. So in other words, the only duties we have to animals, according to this position, are indirect ones. 
Now, the advantage of this position, of course, is that it has the advantage of eliminating completely the conflict between human and animal interests. Whenever animals are protected, human interests are served or not denied by doing so. Now, we might think of this position as morally counterintuitive because it doesn't accord any direct moral word to animals. But nevertheless, it does have, this approach does have the advantage uh, that it reflects the political reality that it's humans who do the valuing of animal interests and it's humans who put animal interests onto the political agenda. So what follows for, the, uh, for farm animals is a consequence of adopting this position. Well, if one, if one holds this indirect duty position, the interests of humans and the protection of farm animals do coincide up to a point. For example, part of the case against industrialised animal agriculture is that, is that it has severe health and environmental consequences affecting many people. And two events, uh, two recent events, reveal the utility of the indirect duty approach for the protection of farm animals. There was a, uh, the recent high profile published research linking the consumption of large amounts of processed meat to, in, to an increased risk of heart disease and cancer. And secondly, there was the horse meat scandal. This has turned humans away from processed meat, partly on the grounds of aesthetics and taste. People don't want to eat horse meat. Well, not, not all people want to eat horse meat, at least. And partly on the grounds of public health. If, if, the, if the meat industry can't be trusted on the content of their products, how can we be sure they are safe? And I did hear on the radio this morning that apparently Asda are now selling corned beef flavoured anti-inflammatories. Yeah. <laughs> well, should, should that be anti-inflammatory flavoured corned beef? I'm not too sure. Um, there is an acid down the road if anyone's interested. So in this context, the, the, the best advertisement for vegetarianism arguably has been provided in recent times by the processed meat industry itself. And it's perhaps only a slight exaggeration to say that meat-eating may become, at least for some people, the new smoking. After all, it wasn't so long ago that tobacco was advertised not only as harmless, but also as, as beneficial. There's just so much to say about that. But, you know, just take it in a minute. <laughs> Anyway, the, from the perspective of, of animal protection, the problem, of course, with these indirect duty arguments is that, that we are not weighing up the interests of animals against the interests of humans. Rather, we're weighing up some human interests against other human interests. And there will always be those, of course, who will argue that sufficient human interests are served by the poor treatment of animals. For example, there are many who would argue that we should be prepared to put up with the extra pollution caused by factory farms or the occasional public health scandal in order to maintain cheap food prices. Indeed, this was the rationale, of course, for factory farming in the first place. What we would seem to need, then, is a, is a non-anthropocentric ethic which says that the moral status of animals is such that we should not exploit them, even if human benefits will accrue from so doing. And few moral philosophers now, and few uh, thinking people, would deny now that animals are sentient. And few would deny that we owe at least something to them directly as a consequence of this. Particularly important in transforming the moral climate was the influential school of thought known as utilitarianism, and its most famous exponent, Jeremy Bentham. Utilitarianism argues that an action is right or wrong according to the degree to which it produces a surplus of pleasure over pain or meets more preferences than it denies. And of course the crucial thing about utilitarianism from the perspective of animals is that it privileges sentience as a benchmark of morality. In other words, all that moral entitlement requires is the capacity to experience uh, pleasure and pain doesn't require agency, it doesn't require complex mental capabilities. And Bentham recognised the importance of, the, of, of his theory for animals, so in, in an oft-quoted passage which is on the slide, 
he pointed out that the question of moral status is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So it's this recognition of the moral significance of sentience that forms the basis of the concept of animal welfare, the ethic of animal welfare. I think it's important here, and I've mentioned this in the past, that there is a difference between animal welfare as a science and animal welfare as an ethic. I'm talking about animal welfare as an ethic uh, at this point. And the central feature of animal welfare as an ethic is an insistence that humans are morally superior to animals. But since animals have some moral worth, we're not entitled to inflict suffering on, on them if the human benefit thereby resulting is not necessary. So the principle of unnecessary suffering is key to the animal welfare ethic. And of course, this, this idea of animal welfare has dominated the discussion of the treatment of farm animals. So there is an unnecessary suffering clause in the major primary legislation relating to farm animal, animals in Britain in 1968, Animals uh, Miscellaneous, uh, Agriculture Miscellaneous Provisions Act, originally passed in 1968. And this was designed to protect farm animals. Animal welfare has also been the driving force for legislative change, primarily because of its flexibility. What's regarded as unnecessary is not static, and nor is it objective, indeed. So over the past few decades, what is regarded as unnecessary suffering has expanded to reflect a growing awareness of the different ways animals can suffer and changes in cultural norms. So many aspects of factory farming, the de of poultry, the use of veal crates, pig stalls and tethers, and the battery cage were regarded as morally acceptable by most people 30 or 40 years ago, but are now being seriously challenged throughout Europe. And this challenge has largely come from within the confines of the principle of unnecessary suffering. So it's now thought by many that it's unnecessary to keep hens confined in battery cages or broiler chickens cooped up in windowless sheds. The problem with the vague character of animal welfare, though, is that it can be used to justify virtually all or any form of animal exploitation as necessary. It's not, therefore, very good at providing strict guidelines for public policy. Now, as a result of this, this vague nature of animal welfare, we, we, we've got three options. We could accept that animal welfare is vague and accept that human benefits must take precedence wherever they are found. We could seek to tackle the vagueness of the animal welfare ethic and seek to tighten it up by offering more rigorous accounts of what exactly unnecessary suffering means for animals in terms of how far the interests of animals are discounted. And some scholars have sought to do this. A typical analysis is the one offered by the, uh, the philosopher James Rachels in a book originally published in 1990. And he distinguishes between what he calls radical speciesism from what he calls a mild speciesism. So radical speciesism is where the relatively trivial interests of humans take priority over the vital interests of non-humans. Whereas a mild speciesism is where we, we may choose for the non-human when the choice is between a relatively trivial human interest and a more substantial interest of a non-human. Now this of course is still vague in the sense that it, it leaves trivial undefined. But if we were putting a monetary value on it, I guess, we could model the ethical permissibility of different practices using these two different versions of animal welfare. For example, from the perspective of a radical speciesism, it would be possible to argue, say, that the extra cost of producing eggs from genuinely free-range operations would not be justified, whereas by contrast, we could say that such a small extra cost would uh, from the, the position, perspective of the mild species disposition, be justified because it's a trivial expense for humans. Rachel's two categories are best seen as representing both extremes of the animal welfare ethic, ethical continuum. 
uh, a position which he describes in general as qualified speciesism. There is a third option, of course, and that is we could adopt an animal rights ethic. That is, we could abandon animal welfare completely. Now, I've pointed out that the, one of the problems with the animal welfare ethic is it contains no automatic constraints which can prevent the exploitation of animals irrespective of the greater good that might result. By contrast, a rights-based ethic has built-in constraints. That is, it's not possible, according to a rights-based position, to sacrifice the most important interests of a rights holder, even if by so doing a greater good will result. And this, of course, is why, exactly why animal rights is such a popular concept for those with an interest in protecting animals. Now, for most animal rights philosophers, animal rights activists, and indeed their opponents too, animal rights and abolitionism are synonymous. And the abolitionist position draws its inspiration, as I'm sure many of you know, from the work of Tom Regan. And Regan, as I'm sure many of you know too, argues that at least some animals are what he calls subjects of a life. And all human and non-human subjects of a life have inherent value. And this equal inherent value for Regan translates into strong moral rights. So Regan argues that there's only one fundamental right, the right to respectful treatment, which derives from the inherent value of both humans and non-human animals. And the implication of this is that to use animals, irrespective of what is done to them whilst they're being used, is illegitimate. So, for Regan, the animal rights movement is abolitionist in its aspirations. It seeks not to reform how animals are exploited, but to abolish their exploitation, to end it completely. Now, of course, a, a prohibition on the confinement and killing of animals would, of course, rule out most of the ways in which animals are currently used by humans, including uses, using them as sources of food. So the, for Regan, the fundamental wrong with, you, with raising and killing animals for food is not that this causes them harm, uh, not that this causes them suffering or harm, or that humans don't really need to eat meat, but because they are viewed and treated merely as a means to human ends, as resources for us. So this strand of animal rights thinking, therefore, maintains that our use of animals can't be justified and therefore seeks to abolish all animal use. <coughs> so for shorthand purposes, this position might be described as the use position in the animal ethics debate. Now this is the totality of the debate as it's usually presented. You're either an advocate of animal welfare or you're an advocate of this abolitionist uh, uh, animal rights position. But this is not all there is to the debate. What is often overlooked is that it's possible to adopt an alternative animal rights position that is not abolitionist, or not necessarily so. Ooh. <laughs> Flex some words is later. <laughs> this alternative animal rights position is based on the assumption that it's perfectly possible to justify the existence of rights for animals which do not result in making all uses of animals illegitimate. And this alternative theory of animal rights is based on an interest theory of rights, or an interest-based theory of rights. Now, I won't go into detail about this version of rights theory here. All I will say is that it accords moral significance according to the interests beings possess. And the most important contemporary exponent of this interest-based theory of animal rights is, 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 is Alistair. Um, and as the title of his book suggests, Alistair argues that animals do not possess an intrinsic interest in liberty because unlike humans, they are not autonomous agents. So as a result, the adoption of animal rights doesn't mean that the use of animals by humans is necessarily prohibited morally because they don't possess an intrinsic interest in liberty. That is, they do not have an automatic right to liberty. And as the title of his book suggests, uh, the effect of this analysis is to decouple animal rights from liberation, 
That's not to say for, for Alistair that all uses of animals are thereby deemed acceptable morally. And the obvious candidate for a use of animals that is illegitimate morally is when it causes suffering. And if this is accepted, it follows that if we are saying that humans have a right not to suffer uh, or not to have suffering inflicted on them, then so should animals. And it's therefore possible, I would argue, to model a version of animal rights based on this principle. And this I've called the, the sentience animal rights position. And as its name suggests, the sentience animal rights position is based on the assumption that at least some non-human animals have an interest in not suffering. And as a, as a result, they have an interest in avoiding suffering that might be inflicted on them by humans. If this is granted, then this is a position which claims that what is wrong with our treatment of animals is not their use, per se, but as a product of what we do to them whilst they're being used. Now, it's important to note that this sentience position can be clearly differentiated from the animal welfare ethic. Because according to the animal welfare ethic, which has often been described as, as uh, or defined in terms of utilitarianism for animal rights for humans, according to this animal welfare ethic, it's permissible morally to inflict suffering on an animal, provided that the benefits to be gained from so doing are perceived to be sufficiently large. What the sentience position does, on the other hand, is to rule out such a cost-benefit uh, a, a cost benefit approach. In other words, even if there is a benefit to be had from practices that inflict suffering on animals, these practices should not be permitted because they infringe the right of animals not to suffer. So what does this position say about farm animals? Well, according to the sentience position, the lives of animals are of no, uh, uh, are of no moral concern. That, that may be an ethical error, but let, let's ignore that for now. What it does say is that provided that suffering is at the very least minimised, then we're not morally permitted to use animals uh, that we are morally permitted to use animal in whatever, whatever way we see fit. What matters for the sentence position is the suffering inflicted on animals. And it's feasible to imagine a form of farm animal husbandry that reduced significantly the suffering of animals. It's been well documented that, that so-called factory farming causes enormous suffering in terms of pain as well as boredom, stress, anxiety and so on. And genuine free-range husbandry systems are the obvious alternative option here. Uh, although looking into the future, there may be two additional options available to us. First of these would be the uh, production of uh, in vitro or laboratory cultured meat. Animals would still be required as, as cell donors, but provided they're treated well, this should not raise any ethical problems. I think the real problem is the, the likely limitation on the type of meat that could be produced, and the current cost, which at present doesn't make it a viable option. I think Peter might have offered a million dollars for someone who can produce uh, uh, a, a, a valid and decently priced form of uh, uh, laboratory meat. The second option we could adopt is a technological solution to the problem of animal suffering, in which factory farmed animals can be genetically engineered so as not to suffer pain, or to have that capacity reduced significantly. Now, if possible, and I think there are considerable doubts as to whether it is possible, this would make even factory farming more acceptable from the perspective of the sentence position, <coughs> often known as producing knockout livestock. Now, generally, in free-range husbandry systems do reduce much of the suffering evident in factory farming. However, even assuming that genuine free-range enterprises are able to satisfy animal interests in not suffering, they're currently, of course, few and far between. <clears throat> so what I've done in this talk is, is to outline the various, or well, the main ethical positions in the animal debate and, and apply them to the case of farm animals. I haven't sought to argue for one of these positions over another. Obviously, this is what the animal ethics literature seeks to do. It asks of each of these positions how far does it correspond to how we think animals ought to be treated. 
Does it, for instance, make the correct normative conclusions from the empirical information we, we have about the cognitive characteristics of animals? Is it logically coherent and, and, and so forth? However, as Jonathan Wolfe has argued correctly, the way that moral philosophy has been practiced is not very compatible with the achievement of public policy goals. Philosophers tend to become famous by arguing for controversial or outlandish views. There's no pressure to come to agreement in moral philosophy. In fact, moral, uh, in fact agreement is unhelpful because it cuts discussion short. So at academic conferences, proponents of particular positions will set out their views, there will be discussion, and that will be it, down to the pub. There's no need to prepare a list of agreed recommendations, and no need to reach a consensus. By contrast, if advances in public policy are to be achieved, it's necessary to agree on a set of recommendations, and this does require the building of consensus. So advances in public policy require a recognition that whether a moral position is correct or right or persuasive takes second place to whether it's widely shared. So anyone who is, is, is interested in, in achieving advances in public policy should heed the advice of the philosopher Bernard Williams, who said that the important question is not what is the best form of society, but rather what is the best form of society we can get starting from here? <coughs> now, Jonathan Wolf argues that the demands of public policy mean we should dispense with setting out moral positions which are then applied to a particular issue. Instead, he prefers to adopt a bottom up approach, focusing initially on the details of any particular policy area. In other words, he would reject the approach that I've taken in the in this talk, listing the various positions that could be adopted and seeking to apply them. I disagree with, 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 with Wolf on this, though. I, I think we do need to have a goal. We do need to have an ambition to which we're aiming. But we also need to ask of this so-called uh, ideal theory at least two questions. One is, is it possible to achieve now or at some time in the future? And secondly, what are the most appropriate stepping stones from where we are now to where we want to be? And this requires us, I think, to start thinking about what has been described in the literature as non-ideal theory. A non-ideal theory considers how the long-term goal of ideal theory, our ultimate endpoint, might be achieved or worked towards. So to engage in a bit of self-promotion at last, what I try to do in, in the book that, that Alison mentioned is, is to examine animal, animal ethics within the context of ideal and non-ideal theory. And in the case of farm animals, the obvious starting point is the animal welfare model. And in the past, I've uh, defended the animal welfare position as the most appropriate current vehicle for animal advocates, even for those who, who hold an animal rights position. Because animal welfare has the advantage of strong name recognition, it's difficult to find anyone now who doesn't accept the goal of animal welfare. However, I'm less sure about its, its utility. The, 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 big, the biggest problem with animal welfare as an ethic is that it contains no limit on what might be done to animals provided that human benefits result. And I would argue that this leads to too much animal suffering. That is, animal welfare as an ethic fails to prevent extreme levels of suffering being, po being imposed on animals if there's a chance that humans will benefit as a result. As a result, despite the improvements to animal welfare that have undoubtedly occurred, they remain relatively minor in scope, and animals still pay a heavy price as a result of the application of the animal welfare ethic. And I guess a classic example here is, is the economic consequences <coughs> to the reform or abolition of practices in animal agriculture. In virtually every case, much is made, accurately or not, of the economic losses that would result from reform or abolition of this or that practice. And from the perspective of animal welfare as an ethic, any economic 
losses that are likely to occur as a result of reform must be at least taken into account. More often than not, though, they tend to predominate in the animal welfare discourse. So in, 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 in the book, I put the case for what I've described as the dissenting position as the most appropriate non-ideal theory. And this, this position, as I explained earlier, doesn't rule out the use of animals, but does prohibit the infliction of anything but minor suffering. Anyway, I'll stop at that.